Big news! Meta just released a new large language model that could potentially rival OpenAI's GPT models in performance, efficiency, and even creativity. This is Llama 2, the open source successor to Meta's earlier large language model, Llama. Llama stands for Large Language Model Meta AI and is free for research and commercial use. This is a big deal. Not only is Meta using Llama 2 to expand their long-standing partnership with Microsoft, but many people across numerous fields are turning their heads towards this shiny new AI. These people include industry professionals, developers, research scientists, academics, and even those in public policy. Today, we'll break down the Llama 2 paper part by part. As a result, we'll chop this video down into sections. First, we'll talk about the architecture of Llama 2. Then we'll talk about the differences between Llama 2 and Llama 1. Finally, we'll examine when to use Llama 2. How does it compare to GPT models? How does it compare to other LLMs in general? All right, those are the three major parts. Feel free to skip around the chapters of this video to listen to the parts that you want. Oh yeah, and there's a little section at the end with some fun bonus notes about Meta's comments on protecting privacy, their carbon footprint, and more. Ready? Let's go. First things first, what even is a Llama model? Let's break it down into two parts, what the model does and how it works. Llama itself is not just one language model, but a collection of foundational language models that were pre-trained and fine-tuned according to Meta's standards of AI training. This paper mentions four models in particular. The first has 7 billion parameters, the next has 13 billion, then 34 billion, and finally the largest has 70 billion parameters. As we can expect, the larger the model, the higher the accuracy, as we can see on this graph here. Specifically, the x-axis measures the number of tokens processed during training. If you're unfamiliar with the idea of tokenization in an AI context, for now you can just think of each token as a word or word fragment, like the ones on screen right now. The y-axis measures the loss of the model. As a refresher, the loss of a language model is a quantity directly related to the number of linguistic mistakes that the model makes during training. So as we can see here, that the more tokens the model reads, the lower the loss becomes. That is, the more that Llama 2 reads, the fewer mistakes it makes when trying to come up with new sentences on its own. As for the nitty-gritty training details, Llama 2 shares much of the same pre-training settings and architecture as its predecessor, Llama 1. In particular, Llama 2 uses the standard transformer architecture, applies pre-normalization using RMS norm, uses Swiglu as an activation function, and a relatively new encoding scheme called ROPE, or Rotary Position Embedding. But alright, that's a lot of big words, and each of these methods can have their own 10-minute video to explain them. But here's a very high-level breakdown. Llama 2 uses a classic architecture to transform input text into an appropriate response, whether that's answering a question or filling in a blank. That's the transformer architecture bit. Learn more about transformers from our blog here. Then, to make sure the model's internal calculations don't go off the rails during training, we use this RMS norm technique. The goal of any normalization technique is to simplify the massive amounts of data, in this case 2,000 billion tokens worth, into a smaller, more digestible form that still contains a substantial amount of information. Further, this Swiglu formula is what decides whether a neuron within Llama's neural network should be activated or not. There are many activation functions like ReLU and Glue. Meta decided they wanted to use Swiglu. This is fully a design choice. Finally, this new rope embedding method is the math way of describing the positional information within language. For example, in the sentence, the cat sat on the mat, we have to somehow mathematically describe the fact that cat comes before sat and mat must come after the and sat. Rope is the method of choice that Meta decided to use to teach Llama 2 about the importance of word order in language. So that's it. Llama 2's pre-training methods consist of 1. A classic transformer architecture that many other LLMs use. 2 a technique that simplifies the 2,000 billion tokens into a more digestible form, three, a specially chosen function that determines whether each neuron should be activated, and four, a new way to show AI the importance of the positions of words and sentences. And after Llama 2 is trained, we can see how it performs across a suite of popular benchmarks, coding, common sense reasoning, world knowledge, reading comprehension, math, and so on. On table three in the paper, we can see that Llama 2 actually has the highest scores across all of these benchmarks, as indicated by the bold-faced numbers on the bottom row of this table. Note that according to Meta, this is the overall performance on grouped academic benchmarks compared to other open source based models. So when comparing Llama 2 to open source models like Llama 1 and Falcon, we see that Llama 2 takes the cake. However, when comparing to closed source models, there's a different story entirely. Llama 2 doesn't get first place on any of these given benchmarks. For example, Palm 2 Large is the best at trivia, defeating Llama 2 by 1.1 points. Likewise, GPT-4 beats Llama 2 in the MMLU benchmark. The MMLU benchmark, by the way, tests on things like history, math, computer science, and so on and so forth. It's basically like the SAT of AI. But all right, given these results, do note that this is not all the training that Llama 2 went through. It also underwent a good amount of fine tuning as well. The result is a model called Llama 2 Chat, which is basically Meta's version of a chatbot, a chat GPT rival, if you will. Much like ChatGPT, Meta put Llama 2 
2 through RLHF, or reinforcement learning with human feedback, to align the model's behavior with human preferences and instruction following. That is, both OpenAI and Meta got humans involved in the fine-tuning process of their chatbots, to make sure these AIs know how to interact with us in our language, as opposed to coding language. If you want to learn more about RLHF, check out this blog. But a really neat aspect of Meta's fine-tuning methods is a new technique they introduced called ghost attention. Ghost attention is based off of a classic attention method, and if you hadn't read the quintessential AI paper, Attention is All You Need, I highly recommend checking that out. But to understand ghost attention, all you need to know is one thing. A popular way humans interact with chatbots is to first say something along the lines of, you are an expert physicist, and then ask it about physics. Or maybe you'd say, you are Napoleon Bonaparte and you will treat me as if I am one of your commanding officers. Then the user would have a quote-unquote conversation with Napoleon. Or even in the case of coding, you could say, you are an expert Python coder, and then you could ask the AI to code or debug with you. We actually did that last one in another video here. Check it out. Well, given this popular pattern of speaking with chatbots, Meta decided to introduce ghost attention into its fine-tuning repertoire. Basically, to ensure that Llama 2 indeed acts like Napoleon or an expert Python coder throughout the entire conversation, Meta synthetically concatenates the act as instruction to all of its user messages in the conversation. Then, once the model has learned that these act as instructions should carry out throughout the entire conversation, the ghost attention method calls for dropping this concatenation later down the line of fine-tuning. The result? Well, Meta has found that this new ghost attention technique helps control dialogue flow over multiple turns. And now, given this new ghost attention method, you may be wondering, how does Llama 2 therefore compare to Llama 1? Let's talk about it. Here's how the Llama 1 family compares to the Llama 2 family across various stats. As we can see here, the largest models of the Llama 2 family each have more parameters than their respective counterparts in Llama 1. Llama 2 also has a universally larger context length that's double the size of Llama 1, and Llama 2's two largest models also have grouped query attention for improved inference scalability. All of Llama 2's models are also trained on much more data, or at least many more tokens, than their Llama 1 counterparts. And as mentioned earlier, there isn't much difference with regards to the learning rate, among other hyperparameters. But in terms of the results across various benchmarks, we can once again refer to this table. As mentioned earlier, Llama 2's performance is monotonically better than that of Llama 1's. For example, again, when it comes to the SAT of AI testing, the MMLU benchmark, Llama 2 defeats its predecessors by at least 5 points for each respective model in its family. However, it is important to note that models like GPT-4 and POM2 Large outperform Llama 2 across various benchmarks as well, as we mentioned earlier. But now let's talk about when you'd use each model. In all honesty, we could just use the stats from the previous section to determine which AI model is best for which job. If you're only working with open source models, then Llama 2, or at least the largest version of Llama 2, is the way to go. Or if you're working locally, just find the open source model that performs the best that your particular computer setup can handle. But for the most general purpose, follow the MMLU benchmark. But if you're not constrained to only open source models, then follow table 4 and use these benchmarks as your guideline. For example, since GPT-4 scored the best on MMLU, that means if you have a question on, say, mathematics, US history, law, computer science, and more, you'd resort to GPT-4 over anything else. But the juicy part is when we see human evaluation of Llama 2 chat in section 3.4.2 of this paper. Human evaluation is often considered the gold standard for judging models for natural language generation, including dialogue models. Meta says, quote, to evaluate the quality of major model versions, we asked human evaluators to rate them on helpfulness and safety. And as seen in this graph, Llama 2 chat outperforms open source models by significant margin in both short, single turn, conversations and longer multi-turn prompts. As we can see here, humans mostly say that Llama 2 quote unquote wins in regards to helpfulness versus its other competitors. And if we see in the very far right, Llama 2 just barely wins against ChatGPT, though nevertheless it wins more often than ChatGPT does. And we won't even mention how much better Llama 2 seems to be than Falcon. But what does this helpfulness look like as a user? Well, Llama 2 chat has a playground that you can use right here. This playground is similar to ChatGPT. You can simply talk to the AI and ask it a variety of questions. And even though the original Llama paper has its own claims, we can actually test this quality ourselves. The results? Well, whenever I ask general questions, it seems to work fine. Hey, how are you? Can you help me write a screenplay about a bird and a rabbit becoming friends? Can you write code that removes all the vowels from a given string? And so on. However, it didn't take long for me to make Llama 2 hallucinate. For example, here, I linked a video and asked Llama 2 chat to summarize it. Of course, the model said it could. And then it proceeded to write a summary. However, the entire summary it wrote was about Elon Musk. This video, is was a recruitment video for DeepGram. It had nothing to do with Elon. So be wary of using Llama 2 for video summarization and even research in general. Sometimes the model hits the mark, like when I asked it to summarize this article, but as usual, there's always the possibility that the chatbot will create an output just for the sake of creating an output. And there's no guarantee that this output will be correct. So if you're a journalist or a researcher, be very careful when using Llama 2 as a guide. Luckily for us, Llama 2 is open source. So if we really wanna create a chatbot that handles research tasks, we as developers can create one. Yes, it'll be a lot of work. And yes, it'll take quite some time to make sure that 
that our research bot is always accurate in its responses, but in theory, it's possible. My recommendation is this. If there is a task that you can fine-tune the general open source Llama 2 model to do, then fine-tune the model as best as you can. This is where Llama 2 has an advantage over the GPT models, like GPT-4 and ChatGPT. The fact that it's open source gives developers the power to build whatever LLM-based AI model they want. As long as the task at hand can be accurately and efficiently solved by an LLM, fine-tuning Llama 2 is a great solution. Certainly a solution that is more robust than having to resort to a bare-bones, unfine-tuned closed-source model like GPT. However, closed-source models still have their merits. Often it is much easier to use a pre-built, market-available model than it is to train and fine-tune your own models. So, for example, if we indeed wanted to correctly summarize videos instead of talking about Elon Musk randomly, we could use something like the demo featured in one of our previous videos. Long story short, here's how to decide which model to use for a specific task. First, if there already exists an LLM that solves your problem out of the box, then use that one. If your use case is more specific than that, then fine-tune an open source model. This is where Llama 2 has an advantage over the closed source models like GPT-4. Finally, if your use case can simply be solved by Llama 2 or GPT-4 out of the box, and you don't mind the potential for hallucinations, then resort to the figure that we showed earlier. That being said, hallucinations are a safety risk, and when testing LLMs, we don't just test them for helpfulness, we also test them for safety. So, speaking of safety, let's talk about what considerations Meta made with regards to the safety of their users while training. First things first, Meta is very clear that they did not use any Meta user data in training. That is, the research scientists at Meta did not, I repeat, did not use your Instagram post, your Facebook profile, or even your threads post to train Llama 2. They say this multiple times throughout the paper. Furthermore, to avoid baking any negative societal biases into Llama 2, Meta made sure to have a diverse training set that allowed for strong demographic representation with regards to pronouns and various identities, ranging from religion to nationality and even sexual orientation. Here's the breakdown of pronouns across the data set. As we can see here, 75.23 percent of the documents used contain some sort of gendered pronouns, whether it's she, her, he, him, or they, them. Meanwhile, almost 94.5% contains some sort of grammatical person pronoun. I, me, mine, you, yours, and so on and so forth. As for the specific breakdown, you can see what percentage of each of these subsets contain she, or he, or it, or I, or me, and so on. And here's a similar breakdown of the data set based on various identities, gender and sex, race and ethnicity, nationality, and so on. Feel free to pause the video to take a closer look. That being said, these numbers can get a bit dense, so let's look at a nice picture. This graph showcases the quote-unquote toxicity score of the document within Llama 2's training set. A toxicity score of 1, or 100%, means that a given document is completely toxic, according to the judgment of an AI called Hatebert. A toxicity score of 0 means that the document is not toxic whatsoever. Meta notes that only 0.2% of their documents have a toxicity score of 0.5 or higher. That is, around 99.8% of documents that Llama 2 is trained on are not toxic, or at least 99.8% of these documents are less than halfway toxic. Finally, Meta briefly discusses the size of a carbon footprint that building Llama 2 produced. As we can see here, they actually tallied up the total carbon emitted by Llama 2 during training. Again, these numbers are dense, but Meta very explicitly states the upshot as follows. Quote, We estimate the total emissions for training to be 539 tons of CO2 equivalent, of which 100% were directly offset by Meta Sustainability Program. That is, they're saying, yes, we did emit a good amount of carbon dioxide, or carbon dioxide equivalent, while training Llama 2, but our sustainability program compensates for those emissions. We're helping the environment more than we're hurting it. Ascertain from those statements and these numbers what you will. That being said, I highly recommend reading the paper in its entirety if you have the chance. There's a lot we could delve deeper into, whether that's Meta's personal take on RLHF, or even their discussion on their red team methods to make sure Llama 2 can't be tricked by malicious users into producing questionable outputs. The paper itself is 77 pages long, but hopefully after watching this video, the entire document seems much less intimidating. If you have any questions, leave them in the comment section below. Links to the paper and all other fun resources we've discussed here are in the description. And as always, follow Deep Grand for more AI content.